Hello, and welcome to Remnant Conversations. My name is Agent 505, and I am here partnering with FOJC Underground Church to bring a series of uh, presentations from our remnant um, within our community to have the opportunity to come and just have uh, conversation. So today uh, is our first presentation and I am so grateful because I get the opportunity to interview one of my best friends, um, best remnant, uh, just somebody who I dearly love and cherish. And so today we're going to um, do a presentation on what do Mormons really believe? And so um, we have our special guest and so I'm just so grateful for her. Um, but before we get started, I would like to start up in prayer and then I'll introduce our guest and then we'll get started. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and honor our father. Dear Heavenly Father, I just come before you and I just want to thank you so much for this opportunity to do this presentation tonight, Father, on Mormonism. And I just thank you so much for our guest and her courageous um, willingness to, to come and, and share with us, Father. I pray that you would anoint her lips, her mind, and that, Father, this uh, very complicated uh, presentation would just be very simple, and that, Father, you would just use us tonight to teach our remnant about this subject and how we can actually minister to our Mormon friends and family. We love you, Father, and in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Amen. So today we have, I just want to introduce you to Don Winders. Um, Don is a seventh generation Mormon. She was raised in a super active Mormon family. She attended seminary. Um, during her high school years, she graduated from BYU, where she was required to always take a religion class each semester. She served as a, on a Mormon mission to Argentina after college. Uh, she regularly attended the Mormon temple. Um, she was married at 32 and sealed in the Mormon temple. She was she divorced and but still sealed to her ex husband. She was raised after uh, she raised three children in the Mormon Church, um, and she discovered the truth about Mormonism 
and left at the age of 53. Wow. What uh, what uh, uh, some accomplishments and thank you, Lord, that we have Don Winters here tonight to share with us about Mormonism and um, just her journey through through life um, and and how she is uh, where she is today. So thank you, Don. I just appreciate your time. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, David and Donna Caracol also want to thank you for um, coming and sharing with the remnant um, your story. And we're just so excited to hear about um, everything that you're going to share with us tonight. So thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Oh, well, um, Thank you. I'm so honored to be the first interviewee you have here on um, Remnant Conversation. So this is this is very, very exciting. Um, I just wanted to kind of put a disclaimer out there before we get started, because um, I just want to make sure that um, that everybody understands that you always have to separate the the doctrine of Mormonism from the people, the Mormon people, who are just wonderful, wonderful people. They're my people. Um, they're my family. Um, I still have children involved with uh, Mormonism. And um, and so um, they're just wonderful people. And I can't have enough wonderful things to say about them. But um, that does not include, however, the Mormon leadership, who I know are aware of um the the deceptions that they have perpetrated uh, perpetrated upon the mormon people where they are they are believing still or whether they have left um and so um so i do not give them any excuse you know um pray for them pray for their repentance but um but not really um well you know not really giving them the grace that i give the mormon people who really are caught in deception because that's where I was. Um, and, and I also just want to say that um, I uh, um, I was I grew up in Utah and um, and so the things I talk about today I um, I will talk about from my experience. You you may be ta you may talk to the Mormon Church is always kind of walking away from certain doctrines and. Um, and not emphasizing them. And so uh, some younger generations are, you know, might not be even aware of the the things that their church has espoused in the espoused in the past. So um, so I just want to make sure that you understand that if you if you bring any of this up with anybody who is who is a Mormon, some of them might not even be aware of this because I'm a little older than some of the younger generation. And I'm just speaking from my experience of um, lots and lots of years in the church and everything that I will bring up, I were discussed openly in Sunday schools and in family home evenings and everything when I was growing up. So none of this is a secret or anything like that, or, you know, it's easily looked up. <laughs> I guess I could say that. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you so much for bringing that disclosure to, to our attention, Don, because, you know, our Mormon friends and family, they are uh, very good people. And um, this presentation is not at all to um, offend them or hurt them in any way. It's truly to be able to share your life experience, what you were, what you were taught and how the father um, came into your life and how these revelations um, came to be. And so I, I do appreciate you acknowledging our Mormon friends and family because I do have, you know, friends and family in, in, in my circle. And um, I know that they are good people. And so, you know, like you said, it's really the leadership that um, we're really putting uh, that blame on in terms of the false teachings and um, and so forth. So I do appreciate that. Um, and with that being said, you know, I, 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 
I, I want to go into our, our first question and just ask, you know, the ins and outs just to get started with like the basics. So can you explain to us how the Mormon God is different from our God in Christianity? Yes, I can. Um, so um, starting with the basics, Mormons believe that, um, well, they, they call him specifically Heavenly Father, which I know that's what many Christians call him, call him too, but they pretty much just call him Heavenly Father. So um, uh, they believe that um, God the Father is not unique. Um, they believe that he is just one of an infinitude of gods that are out there. There are some gods that are higher in rank than he is, and there are some gods that are lower in rank than he is, um, as far as the hierarchy goes, because Mormons always talk about, always seem to have hierarchy in there somewhere. So, um, and they believe that um, the God of this earth uh, lives near a planet called Kolob. And uh, this is talked about in the Mormon scripture um, called um, the Pearl of Great Price. And inside the Pearl of Great Price, they have the Book of Abraham, where it talks about Kolob and that, that is the planet that God's God lives nearest to. I don't know why they just don't didn't say he lives on planet Kolob, but he lives the planet Kolob is the nearest place to where God lives. So, um, and that was, I remember there's a, a Mormon hymn about Kolob. And if you ever see the word Kolob anywhere, you know, it's, it's, it's a Mormon term. As far as I know, no, nobody uses that word except Mormons. But um, it used to be my favorite hymn when I was a Mormon growing up. I actually had a couple of really favorite hymns, but but it was, uh, there was a hymn called, If I Could Hide to Kolob. Um, and um, so I put the first verse on here. There's like three or four verses, but um, but I'm just going to read it. I would sing it to you, but I'm going to spare everybody <laughs> me singing them. <laughs> singing them. That's fine. <laughs> could hide to Kolob. So it goes, <laughs> if you could hide to Kolob. Oh, yeah, they know I do sing a lot. <laughs> Yes, she does. She loves to sing all the time. <laughs> Just walk around making up songs all day long. <laughs> that is true. Uh, okay. So this is this is the first hymn of what used to be one of my favorite hymns. If you could hide to Kolob in the twinkling of an eye and then continue onward with that same speed to fly, do you think that you could ever, through all eternity, Find out the generation where gods began to be. So, and I remember that was always a question kids ask in the Mormon church. It's like, but who was God's father? And it's like, well, it was his heavenly father. And then who was his, who was his heavenly father? It's like, well, it was his, you know, and it's like, but where does it all begin? You know, and it used to cause so much anxiety for my daughter, my first daughter. She used to get really anxious just trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. But where did God's begin? Where did God's begin? They had to start someplace, you know. So yeah. So um, so Mormons believe that um, he is an exalted man who basically went through the same process that we are going through now. Um, he went to an earth that his father created, and he um, and he was born into that onto that earth as a mortal and um, worshiped his heavenly father as his God. And, um, and basically, you know, they believe that he sinned and that he repented and that he just went through the whole process, you know, learned line upon line, precept on precept, just like, just like we are learning. Um, so that wasn't the original doctrine, but, um, Joseph kind of um, came out with this uh, doctrine about um, eternal eternal progression. It's called and and how gods become gods, and you know, and that we then you know can keep progressing as well. Um, so there was something called the King Follett sermon where he came out with all of this, and King Follett was a uh, was a was a, a, a Mormon man. I believe this was in Nauvoo, 
when they were living in Nauvoo who died. And so Joseph Smith was giving um, his eulogy or something. He was speaking at a funeral for King Follett. And uh, when he kind of came out with um, these new teachings. So this is a quote from the King Follett sermon from Joseph Smith. He said, it is necessary that we should understand the character and being of God and how he came to be so. For I am going to tell you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and will take away and do away the veil that you may see. He was once a man like us. Yea, that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ himself did. And that comes from um, the Mormon um, series called History of the Church, in uh, volume six. So, um, and so I mentioned eternal progression. So, um, so they also believe that um, pro progress is eternal if you make it to the highest level of heaven, which is called the celestial kingdom, then you can also progress forever. And so uh, they believe that God the Father is actually still progressing and still yeah. learning things and growing. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, uh, will be even greater in the future than he is now. So, um, so this is a quote from Brigham Young, who was the second prophet of the Mormon church. And he said, therefore, if the law of progression be accepted, God must have been engaged from the beginning and must now be engaged and must now be engaged in progressive development and, in, and infinite as God is, he must have been less powerful in the past than he is today. So, um, so we, we know that this is opposite of what the Bible teaches. And, uh, and so, cause in, in Hebrews, 13, eight through nine, well, speaking of Jesus Christ, but it's God. He says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, which I thought was really key. I like that little on the end. Mm -hmm. That's why I added that. It's like, cause, cause this is Agreed. very much a diverse and strange doctrine about, about God. Um, and then, um, and then James 1.17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And then Malachi 3.6 says, for I am the Lord, I change not. So this is, um, this is opposite that, whereas God is constantly changing as opposed to never changing. So. Um, That's a great point, Dawn. That's a great point um, with with seeing that God never changes, and you know, so that those scriptures are are perfect to uh, describe the God of of the Bible. Yes, for sure. Um, so. Um, I can hear those dogs barking in the background. <laughs> yes, that's okay. We got four of them. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so they believe that God, um, you know, went through his mortal existence on and earth, um, and uh, then he died and was resurrected. And then, as a resurrected man, he has a body of flesh and bone, and so he can therefore copulate with his eternal wives and beget spirit children. And they believe that this is where we come from, that we are spirit children, that our uh, matter, the, the matter that forms us, um, lives it forever. Like Heavenly Father doesn't um, create matter or anything that that's already, it's always been in existence and he just reorganizes it. So, um, so like they believe that he organized the earth into a world, not, not uh, created it, you know, out of nothing. Um, 
and then they believe that um, that then everybody on this earth it, are children of God. And so um, everybody on this earth are our spirit brothers and sisters. And so to become a child of God, because um, we know through Christianity, this was something that kind of blew my mind is that not everybody is a child of God because Mormons believe that everybody's a child of God, but that no, you have to be adopted into God's family to become a child of God, you know, a son or, or daughter of God. So, um, so that was a very new concept for me. Um, and then, um, so all this area where we were spirit born as these ethereal spirit children on that planet near Kolob is called uh, the pre-existence or the pre-mortal life in Mormonism. And just like a, a puppy grows up to be a dog and a kitten grows up to be a cat and so forth, um, they believe that as children of God, we grow up to become gods and that that's our destiny. And so, um, but in order to become a, a full-fledged God and be able to create our own planets and have spirit children that we then send down to create an earth so that they can go down and go to, um, that we have to have a body because he Heavenly Father has a body flesh and bones and so um and so that's one reason why we are born onto this earth and um and the veil of forgetfulness is put over our minds when we are born and so then um we're kind of here to be um tested and to to see if we will still obey god you know down here on earth even though we have this veil of forgetfulness and there's certain ordinances that we have to receive while we're here on earth, um, one being baptism, uh, but not just any baptism. It has to be baptism by a Mormon priesthood holder. And, um, and then um, there's other ordinances as well, which, um, which are obtained in the Mormon temples. So I um, won't really go into Mormon temples here because it's a lot to go into, but I don't have any problem talking about what goes on in Mormon temples because um, I I know um, you know when I was coming out of Mormonism I read the scripture in um, Matthew 10 27 and it says what I tell you in darkness that speak ye in the light and what ye hear in the ear that preach ye upon the house the housetops so um, and that really kind of hit me because in in the Mormon temple there's a lot of um of just secret secrets being whispered in in ears and and, and information being passed through the ears so um and so I have no problem talking about that if anybody's interested in talk, in, in me telling them about that at some future time that's very interesting, Don. You know the secrets in the ears, and yeah, if anybody uh, would like to know more about the temple, uh, the Mormon temple rituals, in all caps, put your questions, and um, Don would be more than happy to answer those questions for you. Um, just you can put those in the in the chat, and uh, we'll be looking at that. So thanks. Um, Don, just everything that you've explained up until now, it, it totally is is a different um, Heavenly Father, you know, because um, you pointed out some scriptures that are very clear and um, define uh, the, the Heavenly Father in the Bible compared to the Mormon Heavenly Father. And, and um, that that's very straightforward. And for us to understand and and might even be very um shocking for some to to hear this because it's it is very different from the word of god um you know so so kolob uh, that comes from the book of abraham um you mentioned something about joseph smith was he he was the one that introduced it or um where does that, you know, 
where did that get introduced in the Mormon church? The book of Abraham or the yes. idea of Kola? Both. Oh gosh. Um, it's a lot to go into right now. Maybe, maybe, maybe we should um, talk about the book of Abraham and the Pearl of Great Price and so forth at some point, because that was actually um, one of the very first things that was like, um, kind of like a people talk about in Mormonism that are that, that have left Mormonism, but you have like a shelf and any doubts you get about the Mormon doctrines and stuff, you just keep putting it on the shelf, you know, and until the shelf starts to crack, you know, and that was probably the first crack in my shelf was when, um, when I found out about the, the book of Abraham, um, and stuff like that. So actually I could go into a whole story about that. Um, supposedly they were translated from some, uh, uh some, um, papyrus that came with some Egyptian mummies that the Mormons bought because Joseph Smith said, no, these mummies have a papyrus that was written by the book of Ab by Abraham. So, Okay. Well, that'll definitely be something on our list to cover because that is um, important to know. I, I Just being somebody who has tried to witness to Mormons um, this is, you know, knowing this information and how, how they might present it. Um, we could present truth with scripture and in a loving kind way to be able to, um, like you said, they can have that shelf that they put, you know, these, these things on the shelf. And then later on, they look at and begin to have their eyes open just like you did, Don, which is 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 wonderful. So I I don't have any questions on on the Heavenly Father um, versus the Christianity Heavenly Father, and um, and so I I appreciate the detail that you put into even the pictures here that really explain a lot about about who that is, and it is a different God. So um, with that being said, Don, um, would you be able to describe the difference between the Mormon Jesus and our Jesus, which are different as well? Yes, they are. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I guess when it comes to um, the difference, like if you ask a Mormon, if they believe in Jesus Christ, um, you'll probably get the answer that yes, we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God in the flesh. And we believe that as well. So you would be like, oh, we're we're on the same, you know, we, we believe the same thing. They believe in Jesus, we believe in Jesus, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, but when a Mormon this this is kind of a problem within Mormonism in that you you're each speaking from your point of view but you're saying the same thing not realizing that what the other person is saying is very different from what you know what the other person is thinking about what they're saying is very different from what you are thinking when you are saying it you know so um so when a mormon says that jesus christ is the son of god in the flesh um they, they don't mean what followers of jesus christ think they are saying. So um, so I talked a little bit about the pre-existence. Um, and so they believe that um, that Jesus in the pre-existence, his name was Jehovah, and that he was the firstborn spirit child of um, Heavenly Father. So uh, basically that makes him our, our spiritual big brother. Um, but the way he differs from us in that he is not only is the son of God in the spirit like we are, but he is also the son of God in the flesh, which means they believe that God the Father, who has a physical body and can procreate, physically came down to earth and had sex with Mary to impregnate her with Jesus. Um, so 
in that way, they they do not believe that Mary was a virgin. Um, so now Brigham Young, again, the second president of the or prophet of the church, um, in the in something called the Journal of Discourses, which is just a um, they always were very good at keeping records. They always had secretaries around. So these were journals of uh, journals or, or just records that were kept of um, any speeches that were given, um, meetings that were held, and you know the the notes of the meetings and everything like that. So, um, a, so Brigham Young said the birth of the Savior was as natural as are the births of our children. It was the result of natural action. He partook of flesh and blood, was begotten, was begotten of his father as we were of our fathers. Consequently, ev um, oh, yeah. So that's kind of saying that, um, kind of tells it all right there, how Jesus was mm -hmm. born. And so that kind of like is what they mean when they say that. Jesus Christ is the Son of God in the flesh. Wow. Um, and also something that is, well, first let me just ask you really quick, like what that's people find that really shocking. And I remember the first time I was in a Sunday school class when our teacher, you know, told told us this. And I remember going, ew, you know, it's so disgusting, you know, because we were kids. But um, but I mean, a lot of people find that very shocking. But mm -hmm. how, what's your reaction? Well, yeah, that that's definitely something that's not taught in the Word of God, and and in up in my upbringing of being a dispensationalist. So yes, it's very shocking to hear that um, that God Himself um, copulated with Mary. Yeah to have Jesus because in the word of God, it, it does not say that. And, and so that is extremely shocking um, and helps us to understand um, when they're referring to, to, you know, Jesus, it definitely is a different Jesus. And I have had um, Mormon family members tell me that. And so it's good to to learn this and to understand what they've been taught. And so that's just unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, and in order to make Jesus legitimate, you know, um, as opposed to illegitimate, um, they teach that Mary was one of God's many wives um, that he was married to um, and that um, and they believe that, like, to be married, what they call eternal marriage, um, or a celestial marriage, occurs in, in a temple, and, and it's actually called a ceiling. And um, and so there's some some marriages that are for just this earth only, and then there's other marriages that are eternal or forever. So they believe that Mary is actually one of God's many wives, and that um, he just gave her to Joseph for Joseph to be her husband in this life only, but that um, but the shoes actually was pre-married somehow to God. So, um, mm -hmm. so that was always very interesting. And mm -hmm. they also believe, um, I was just taught this all growing up, which I guess they don't talk about so much anymore, but um, the fact that Jesus was married and not only was he married, but that Jesus was a polygamist because Mormons, um, they, they, though they don't practice polygamy now, they very much do believe in polygamy, and um, and they believe that it will be practiced in marriage. I mean, in in heaven, if you if you are in the celestial kingdom, um, and that, um, and then they used to teach previously that you had to practice polygamy. To reach um, and and to reach exaltation, which is um, sometime I'll have to go through this, um, which mm -hmm. is the third level of the third. So there, they believe there's three levels of heaven, and then the last level of heaven has three levels, and so you have to be to the top of the top, and up there, and uh, 
And then, but they believe like to, to get to that point where you would become a God yourself, you had to practice polygamy. So, um, so they believe that Jesus married several women and had children. Um, so Joseph Fielding Smith, who was um, the more, uh, the tenth Mormon prophet, um, he in a meeting he was asked the question: In the temple ceremony, we are told that only through temple marriage can we receive the highest degree of exaltation and dwell in the presence of our heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. Christ came here to set us the example in all things. Therefore, he must have been married. Am I right? And then the Joseph Fielding Smith answered, yes, but do not preach it. The Lord advised us not to cast pearls before swine. So, and then um, another one of the early Mormon apostles, and he was actually next in line to become the next prophet of the church, um, but but he didn't. Joseph uh, Brigham Young became the second prophet, but um, he said, I said in my lecture on marriage at our last conference that Jesus Christ was married at Cana of Galilee, that Mary, Martha, and others were his wives, and that he beget children. So, and it also talks about um, when he was resurrected. It said, it would be natural for a husband in the resurrection to appear first to his own dear wives and afterwards show himself to his other friends. Um, if all the acts of Jesus were written, no, no doubt, should learn that these beloved women were his wives. We have now clearly shown that God, the father had plurality of wives. Um, like when he was mortal, he had plural wives and one of uh, one or more being in eternity by whom he begat our spirits as well as the spirit of Jesus, his firstborn. We have also proved most clearly that the son followed the example of his father and became the great break, the great bridegroom to whom king's daughters and many honorable wives to be married were married. Um, so yeah, that kind of gives you a little idea about their beliefs about Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, Don, do you believe? Uh, do you do Mormons believe that Jesus redeemed us? of our sins? Do, do Mormons believe? Uh, do, the, do they believe that Jesus redeemed us from, from our, from, from our sins? Um, yes, they do. I'll go uh, to a degree. Um, so, um, Brigham Young, um, taught that, you know, since there are infinite number of gods, then there are infinite number of worlds that that they put their children upon, and 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 so um, Brigham Young taught that there were actually an infinite number of redeemers. So um, he quoted again in the Journal of Discourses. He said, um, "Every earth has its redeemer, and every earth has its tempter, and every earth and the people thereof, in turn and time." receive all that we receive and pass through all the ordeals that we are passing through. Um, and they also teach that each planet um, should, even though there are etern, etern, e infinite number of gods that each earth only worships the God that they belong to, you know, that put them there on that earth, so. So they, they do believe that he is a redeemer, and but they do believe that we are saved by our works. They're very works-based. Um, uh, they believe that the atonement of Jesus Christ was not a complete atonement. And um, one of the big scriptures that they always like to quote when it comes to this is found in the Book of Mormon. And it's in 2 Nephi 25, verse 23. And it says, For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children, and also our brethren, to believe in Christ, and to be reconciled to God. 
For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. So they're very big that like Christ's atonement is like the gap. So he covers the gap between what if we've done all that we can do in this life, then he his 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 blood will pay the difference to get us to heaven. Um, and um, my problem with that is how can you define how, wh what person on this earth can possibly do all that they can do? I mean, really, who 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 among us do does everything we can do? You know, I remember when I was growing up, it was a really common story. It came from the Children's Friend, which is the 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 magazine for uh, primary children in the Mormon Church, and um, and it talks about a, a little girl who really wanted a new bicycle, right? And so her father says, well, okay, then you start saving your money. And when you have enough money, then, you know, then we'll go down and we'll get you your new bicycle. So the, the little girl was so excited. So she would take on all these extra tasks, you know, weeding, weeding the garden, doing extra dishes, you know, doing whatever so she could get, um, paid for the all the chores that she was doing you know and they were like she'd get like a quarter for this and a quarter for that you know and she put these into a a quart jar that she was collecting you know saving up for her bicycle and then um and she just did that for what she what seemed like forever and for her and the you know and she got like she had like you know a quarter of the qu the quart jar was full of quarters and nickels and pennies and stuff and so so she brought the the jar to her dad and plunked it on his desk and said, is this enough to get my bicycle? And um, and so the dad looked at his little girl with her eager face and eyes and said, yes, honey, this is enough to get you a bicycle, right? So she was all excited and they went uh, to the store and um, she picked out a bicycle and she was so excited she was getting her bicycle. And then when they got up to the counter, she put her jar of coins up there on the counter, you know, and uh, they counted out all the change. And then, um, but of course then the father paid the difference between what she had earned and what, um, and what the bicycle cost. And that was always taught to us as children as an example of the atonement of Jesus Christ. So, um, so that's kind of, that's, that's kind of what they believe. They're really big um, believers in the scripture in James. They quote it all the time. And I remember as a Mormon missionary, I would use this scripture all the time. In James 2.18, um, it says, Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Shew, thee thy, um, shew me thy faith without thy works, and I will shew thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But thou wilt, but wilt thou, wilt, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. So mm -hmm. they would always teach that you're saved by your works, that your faith without your works isn't worth anything. So, do you have any anything to say there on that part? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you're doing a, a, it's very straightforward the way you are bringing this presentation, Dawn, and, and its complexities about who, who Jesus really is and what, what they believe. And it's, it's mind blowing. It, it, it really is. Um, for somebody who has never, um, been raised in, in this, in this doctrine, it, it's, it's surprising. It, it really is because just like you said, sometimes you could be talking to a Mormon and I have been in that, in those shoes where I'm talking to them and I'm just talking about Jesus and I'm loving Jesus and I'm honoring him and exalting him. And I'm thinking that they're on the same, um, that we're talking about the same thing. And I, I look back now and I realize 
we really were not. And this, this answers so many questions for me about who their Jesus is and who our Jesus is, you know? Yeah. And even looking at the slides here in the, the middle section, there's something that says stolen salvation of the Mormon people. It is yeah. true that many of the Christian churches worship a different Jesus Christ than is worshiped by the Mormons of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I'm that must have been a prophet, Bernard Brockbank. I think he, he was a that? I think he was an apostle, but yeah. Um, okay. they Same. they have always yeah. thought that our Jesus is not their Jesus. That you know that they have the truth about who Jesus is. So, and I know um, there's something that has come up in um, various movies. Um, they made a movie called, um, there's uh, it actually was a series called Under the Banner of Heaven, which was about um, some uh, some Mormons who were exercising what is called blood atonement, and they um, they killed uh, killed killed some people in their family. But um, so um, so that kind of comes with under the atonement of Jesus Christ. So um, so Joseph Smith taught that there were some sins that were so serious um, that they put the sinner beyond the reach of the atoning blood of Christ. So Christ's atonement and his and the blood he spilled for the atonement it was pretty good, but it wasn't good enough, you know, to cover all the sins. So, um, so for the people that had committed these serious sins, um, their only hope was in having their own blood shed to atone for that sin. And um, so this doctrine is called the doctrine of blood atonement, and it states that the person's blood has to be spilt on the ground in order for them to receive um, forgiveness in the next life. So there's no repentance, there's no forgiveness for them in this life, but in order for them to receive forgiveness in the next life, they have to shed their own blood or somebody has to shed their blood for them, you know? So these are um, murder, uh, the breaking of the temple oaths, um, apostasy from the church, and uh, and then later on, um, Joseph Smith, I mean, um, Joseph Smith was nothing next to Brigham Young. Brigham Young took this whole doctrine of blood and atonement to a whole different level. So there was a historian called Juanita Brooks, and um, and she wrote in in her paper, it said, Brigham Young advocated and preached it without compromise. Brigham Young, in an 1857 fire and brimstone sermon, demanded to know whether his flock would have the courage to do what was necessary should a fellow Mormon commit an unforgivable sin. He asked, will you love that man or woman well enough to shed their blood? And, uh, and, he, and, he, and he would refer to this, this blood atonement, as something that was merciful and loving. Like if we, you know, if we didn't love the person, you know, then we wouldn't kill them. We kill them because we love them, you know. And so it's it's kind of, it's a very sick doctrine, you know, and it, I can even tell you other things that he said that he would kill people for, which, which is in addition to this. So basically anything you did that didn't please him was was worthy of a blood atonement or if it just wanted you out of the way or whatever. But um, so, um, and he would use, it was a very powerful mechanism for, for him to keep the, keep them. I mean, they'd moved at that point, they'd moved out to Utah. They were isolated from the rest of the world. And, um, and he, and it was a way to control people and keep them in line. You know, power just went to his head. He was like, he was like basically God out there to everybody. And, and uh, and all he had to do was say, "Yep, oh, you know they they messed up. Go spill their blood on the ground, you know." And and there's so many stories in um, people's journals, you know, because because Mormons not only do they keep good records themselves, but they really encouraged 
um, the members to keep journals. And, you know, and a lot of people in their journals, they they talk about this, that this happened to their dad or their, you know, or whoever, you know, whoever in there um, that they were blood atoned. Mm. So, um, so uh, fundamentalists, uh, the, going back to the under the banner of heaven, um, the more fundamentalist Mormons are those who believe that the Mormon church um, distanced themselves from the, the early teachings of the Mormon church, like what Joseph Smith taught and what Brigham Young taught. And, you know, just few of the early prophets, but then as time went by, they distanced themselves from these doctrines, right? But they believe that that was uh, apostasy. And so they're, they believe in the fundamentals of Mormonism going back to what the early prophets taught. And so, um, so that's what that those, those Mormons who had become fundamentalist Mormons then were executing blood atonement um, uh, you know, and that happens quite commonly. You hear about it in like the um, the polygamous colonies and stuff like that. You know, so a mm -hmm. lot of crazy stuff goes on there. So, yes, I've actually uh, watched some testimonies um, of fundamentalists and and their stories, and I've heard these same these same things that you're saying, Dawn, they they actually share that and um, the blood atonement. And, you know, I had a question about um, with, with like Brigham Young, um, you know, would he be the only one that could determine if somebody's blood atonement could be done or could like a member make that decision for something, you know? Uh, I'm just curious because um, I guess maybe yes, right? Because the movie, a lot of the movies, a lot of the testimonies that I've heard, it's and and even some of the um, the the mass killings that they did. You know, there was something going on there. So uh, it almost sounds like encouragement to members that shedding blood for any one of these apostasy breaking the temple oaths was like okay yeah yeah I and mean, you know um and that's pretty much if somebody wanted you know somebody's land or something you know they could go and say oh look you know I, you know accuse him of doing something and go and you know kill him for it you know um so yeah there's there's a lot of stories like that and then um, though the Mountain Meadow Massacre did come from uh, Joseph, I mean, from Brigham Young, um, that was considered a blood atonement for the death of one of their apostles, Parley P. Pratt, that occurred in Arkansas. So um, as we know, the, the Mormons were practicing polygamy. And, um, and so they're always like on the hunt for women to marry, especially young, beautiful women, right? And so Parley P. Pratt was doing a mission in Arkansas, I'm pretty sure it was Arkansas, and, um, and he found this guy's wife that was very beautiful and he converted her to Mormonism and then he wanted her as his plural wife. And so, um, so I think he basically took her as a plural wife because they didn't, I mean, you could only legally be married to one wife anyway. So. Um, and then when the husband found out, he was really angry and he he offed Parley P. Pratt in Arkansas. And so um, the Mormons were very angry about that. And so when this wagon train was walk going through Utah from Arkansas um, on, on the way to California, which a lot of which which a lot of uh, wagon trains did go through Utah um, on the way to California or Oregon, um, uh, he he ordered uh, mass the massacre of all of them and they killed them all. Women, um, the only ones that were spared were like the really young children. And, um, and yeah, they, mm -hmm. they they killed them all and claimed. Now, of course, he tried to back away from it. I think only one person actually was blamed in the end for that. But, but um, but it was, it was documented well enough that everybody knew where the, 
where yeah, the I've heard was going. Yeah. Nobody would have I've done heard that without talking about it. Yeah, Brigham Young. I think they made a movie about. It. I've never seen it, but I think there's a movie about the Mountain Mountain Meadow Massacre. But nobody mm -hmm. in Utah would have dared do that without Brigham Young's approval. So let's just let's just put it that mm -hmm. way. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting. We can, we can go in, we can go into all that even more yeah. later on. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah, a lot to say about all that. Mm -hmm. I was looking at these pictures again, Don, and I see um, these uh, two, they look, they both look like Jesus kind of. And um, I'm curious because um, I've heard that Mormons believe that Satan is Jesus's brother. So I'm looking at this picture and I'm, I'm wondering, is, is that true? And is that supposed to be Jesus and Satan? In this yes, picture. it is true, and yes, in that in that picture, um, that's Jesus, of course, with the beard, and then that's um, Lucifer. So Lucifer was an also one of the first few, you know, early. I don't know if he was the next born after Jehovah, but Lucifer was one of the firstborn of. The father, and so the white-haired guy is the father, and then that's Jesus and Lucifer. So yeah, they do believe that, and they believe that, um, you know, when when God um, had a plan to build an earth and to send us down to the earth to get bodies so we could become like Him, um, that um, they was a big council in heaven. So the council in heaven was basically all of us. We were all there. And we, um, and Jesus and Lucifer put forth a plan of salvation, which would be a way to save all of us so that we could all come back and live with Father again and become gods ourselves. And, um, and his plan was that he would come down and he would make sure that everybody did everything right, that they got all of the ordinances done, that they did everything perfectly, and so that they could um, come back. And so we wouldn't have any freedom of choice. We'd have to come down, get done what we needed to get done, and then and then we could go back to heaven. And Jesus Christ or Jehovah, which is was his pre-existence name, um, he put forth a plan that um, that everybody would come down and they would be allowed free agency or freedom of choice, freedom to choose good or evil, and that then. Um, uh, and then maybe, maybe some of them would be lost, but at least they would have the freedom. And then he would be then the redeemer who would, you know, help us to get back to, um, to the presence of the father. So, so then, um, the father chose Jesus's plan, which, um, really made Lucifer angry. And so, um, Every, the council in heaven, which was all of us, all the children of Heavenly Father, get you know, took pick sides, right? And so one third of the spirits um, went, uh, chose Lucifer's plan, and then um, and then the rest chose Jesus's plan. Um, though there were fence sitters who didn't take either side, which is a very interesting story for another day. So if anybody wants to hear about the fence sitters, you know, we can, we can talk about that. So, um, so anyway, that, that was, uh, how then, you know, Lucifer got so angry that he, and, um, and then the, then the, the spirits that followed him were cast down to the earth. And so he became the tempter and, um, and then Jesus became the redeemer for this, for this earth. Mm -hmm. Um, so all this is, um, all this is part of a very complex thing, which we can't go into now because I would have to draw diagrams and everything, but there's, it would be um, a way, all this could be discussed in the Mormon plan of salvation. So, um, mm -hmm. so, so if anybody's interested, we could talk about that at another time, but. Yeah, if you have any questions about the plan of salvation and the fence sitting of the Mormon doctrine, put that in all caps and we'll, 
we Don will be more than happy to come back, back and explain that in more detail to us because it does sound very complicated. I was actually going to ask you, well, then who is the tempter? Because in the journal of discourse that you read above, it, it mentioned that. And I and I thought in my head, well, who do they refer to as the tempter? So now I understand that um, because Lucifer was upset that he wasn't chosen, then he became the tempter. So, mm -hmm. so, so interesting and just <laughs> unbelievable, you know, to think that um, this really is uh, not what the word of God says and how different the teaching is. And yes, when we're speaking to our Mormon friends and family and we're referencing Jesus it's not the same Jesus and they even admit to that and I I can see why yeah yeah very different and and you know that it's got to be wrong because it is so complex I mean all of these things I mean you basically have to take an hour and draw you know crazy diagrams to try to explain Mormon doctrine and you know that is not everything like you said is so simplistic and simple god makes things so simple for us you know yeah. for us to understand he doesn't make anything so complicated and complex as as this but anyway that explains how the devil or lucifer is the brother of jesus but not only jesus he's our brother as well and um as are the archangels there are there are there are older brothers and as is the holy ghost mm. yes yes which we are going to talk about next and that's my my next question for you john um is that uh, okay so we've talked about the father we've talked about jesus and just such a, a great presentation on those differences so clear how you did that don it's amazing um the complexity of the doctrine and the truth versus the truth of what the father says in his word, who the father is and who Jesus is. So thank you. That's just so helpful. And I just want to remind our audience again, that if they have any questions that have not been covered or that they would like to know more about, put that in all caps and uh, we'll, we'll be re-looking at this and Don would be more than happy to come back and answer our questions. Cause I know, for those of us that this is the first time we've heard this, it's really um, unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, but with that, you know, let's go into our next subject of the Holy Ghost. So we've talked about the Father and Jesus. And so um, what do Mormons believe about the Holy Ghost, Don? Okay, the Holy Ghost. Um, so... So we don't know his name like we do Lucifer and Jehovah, but the Holy Ghost was also one of the elder children of Heavenly Father. Um, so he has not received a physical body, so he is still a spirit. So somehow as a spirit, he, he physically can't be everywhere at once, but somehow his influence is felt everywhere or can be felt everywhere so that's kind of like what this little diagram is showing like you have the father and then the son and then you have the holy ghost and even though he's there like his influence can be felt by everybody you know kind of a thing so um so mormons believe that you know to become a full god to be able to procreate and make and have your own spirit children and everything um that you have to go you know, you have to come to an earth, you got to get a body and go through the mortal process. And so um, Mormons believe, at least I was always taught from my childhood up, that in the millennium or during the millennium that um, the Holy Ghost then will be born to a woman and get a body. And then he will, you know, go through a mortal life and be either die and be resurrected or somehow be translated to receive his glorified body. So um, so that's why um, a lot of Mormons even get confused. I have the little drawing up there that says the Holy Ghost is a member of the Godhead 
and um, you need a body to become a god. <laughs> so, <laughs> because that's very much taught in Mormonism that you have to have a body to become a god. So, um, but they believe that um, that both the Holy Ghost and um, Jesus, who was Jehovah, um, somehow because of their obedience and that they were so in in line with God's purpose and everything that they they are referred to as gods um even though they hadn't hadn't come to earth and got a body yet so um so like in like they do believe that um Jesus Christ um created the earth so in their pearl of great price in Moses 133 um, God the Father says, worlds without number have I created, and I also created them for mine own purpose, and by the Son I created them, which is mine only begotten. So we can see from this that Jesus was a God before, before he was mortal. And, um, and so we are assuming it's the same for the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. They usually use the term Holy Ghost, Mormons do, but it's it's interchangeable. So, so um, the, the thing is you can't really compare our, um, our concept of God with the Mormons concept of God, because you can tell by what I'm saying, the concepts mm -hmm. of, of God and what God is or what a God is, is, is very different than you know, so that's why we're kind of, though you're talking about God, you're actually talking apples and oranges. You're not really um, talking the same concepts. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Um, did you have a question? Did you have a comment? Well, I, I, as you say that, I, I, as a witness to that, I, I can agree with that because I've, I've had tried to have conversations with more men, friends and family, and um, it, it just, it's so different, you know, and you, you think you're talking about the same, but you're, but you're really not. And, you know, the one thing that came to my mind as we're talking about um, the Holy Spirit having to come and have a mortal body it just reminds me of um, the script, the scriptures that talk about um, the man of perdition that's to come, and how that might fall into this um, in the end times. And that's crazy because so. I had never thought about that. But you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, what if what if the man of perdition does come? And tells the Mormons, hey, I'm the Holy Spirit, you know, and I've just come down to earth in the flesh, you know, to help you guys out now, you know. I mean, who knows? Because that's that's what they believe, that he will have to come and get a body, you know, at some point. You know, I was always taught the millennium, but it's getting pretty close to the millennium now. So, so who, who knows, you know. Um, so as far as the gift of the Holy Ghost... Mormons believe that only Mormons get the gift of the Holy Ghost. So after you're baptized, then um, men who hold the Mormon priesthood will put their hands on your head and they give you um, a gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so they believe that it, it's only Mormons that get the gift of the Holy Ghost, but everybody who's born on earth um, can feel what's called the, 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 um, the light of Christ, and they call it the conscience. Like we all have a conscience given to us, which is just the light of Christ. So somewhere in your soul, every every person on earth knows what's right or wrong somewhere. Um, but only Mormons get the actual gift of the Holy Ghost. So, and um, how old are you, Dawn, when that uh, happens? I see the the little girl there. How? What age do Mormons believe they receive that? They, they say um, eight years old at the age of eight is the um, age of accountability. So um, 
Of course, you can get baptized at any time if you're a convert or whatever to Mormonism. But um, but at the you can't be any earlier than eight years old. So. So that's that's the age they came up with. Age of accountability is eight. And um, and I can actually say. Um, I don't know if I should even say this. This is probably really controversial or awkward, but it it it's somewhat confusing because there is a spirit in Mormonism. And I don't think it's a Holy Spirit, but there is a spirit that makes you like, you feel like this burning in your bosom. Um, I remember praying about, you know, I remember feeling it when I was reading Doctrine and Covenants or whatever, you know, and I would you know, get a good feeling or like these hymns, you know, when I would sing them and I would, I would just like feel what I thought was the Holy Spirit. And it's also a spirit that keeps you like, it's like this false peace that keeps you where you're at. It keeps you happy in Mormonism. It's like, cause, cause Satan wants you right where you're at, you know? So he generally like really blesses Mormons. Like a lot of times, you know, they think they're getting blessed because they're very successful in their, um, uh, you know, Mormons are generally very successful in their careers. And um, a lot of times Mormons will specifically seek out very lucrative careers because uh, most of the apostles and, um, and general authorities and even like state presidents are, are, are very wealthy. They're generally independently wealthy. And a lot of them are doctors and lawyers and, you know, very high paying careers. And so, um, but they think when they're getting blessed by all this worldly stuff that, that it's because of their righteousness, because they're being righteous, God is blessing them because they're doing all the good things a Mormon does and everything. And, um, but I know that like I was, always very successful in my careers and everything too, you know, and kind of felt the same way. It's like, oh, I must be, you know, I must be a good person because look how God is blessing me, you know, but actually I think it's a lot of it is Satan blessing you because he's the God of this world and he wants you, he likes you right there in the Mormon church. He likes you right there, not, you know, um, he's, he's, he's got you right where he wants you. And so you don't really have a lot of conflict sometimes with the world you know you, the world seems to really embrace you and um and also just like yeah there's kind of like this false peace and i and i and i got to say that there are times and it seems very different when the true god actually did reach out to me cuz i did have experiences when i was a mormon with the true god you know and um and they were very powerful. Like there were experiences where I, I couldn't stop crying. You know, it's like, I was just so overcome, you know, but it was, it, 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 you know, but it wasn't a lot, but I do know that um, the, the Mormon, the Mormon quote unquote, Holy Spirit will keep you at peace and happy and feeling that burning in your bosom um, because the Mormonism never teaches that the heart is desperately wicked and who can know it. They, they very much teach that if you get a burning in your bosom, that's the Holy Spirit testifying of truth. But I remember when I was, um, I had a friend who was very, very Christian. And um, we would talk a lot about what they believe versus what I believe. He would ask me what the Mormons believe. And and I would, you know, and he would tell me kind of like what, what he believed and stuff like that. And it was just like, because I was always very interested in, you know, quote unquote, spiritual things. So, um, and so I remember like we were both consultants. We didn't live in the same state or anything, but we had met through work. And um, and so we would be uh, consulting at different places. And then instead of traveling home, we would use our plane ticket to travel someplace, you know, that we wanted to check out, you know, and then we would go there for the weekend and we would hang out like in New York City or something, wherever we wanted to fly to. And then and every time I was going to go uh, hang out with this person, I was just, I would get like this awful feeling. It was just like, 
this horrible like feeling in my stomach and I get thoughts going through my head that like if you if you go and and to this you know if you go there then your mom's going to die or something terrible is going to happen you know and I remember going oh my gosh this is so weird why would the holy spirit be telling me these horrible things you know and I really had a good time and I really wanted to you know to go hang out in New York City or whatever you know so so I would always go and I remember there was one time where um, they were coming to Houston because I was living in Houston at the time. And um, and I just like got this really, really, really bad feeling like, you know, your life is going to go down the toilet, you know, if, if you let them come and visit you. And I would be like, that is such a weird thing for the Holy Spirit to be telling me. You know, I thought the Holy Spirit was supposed to be all, you know, peace and joy and burning bosoms and stuff. And so um, plane tickets were bought and everything was already done. And so, you know, so I didn't cancel. So they came out and and everything. And then when I dropped them off at the airport, um, when I was driving away from the airport, I was attacked, like physically attacked. And I had never experienced anything like it. And I didn't have any reference for it. I thought it was the Holy Ghost that was attacking me, you know? And I remember I was screaming and yelling and I was just like, oh my gosh, it was just like a horrific experience. And it was very physical, you know? And I ended up getting in a car wreck because of that. Like I was just so distraught and I was, you know, yelling and screaming and waving my hands around. And I ended up getting in a car accident, you know? And and so then I called um, called this person and I was just like, I can't ever see you again. I don't want to ever talk to you again. I don't want anything to do with you ever again, you know? And um, because I was just like, I'm not going through that again, you know? But I remember in my heart, I was always just like, why did the Holy Spirit do me like that? That was so weird, you know? It's like, and, um, but now I understand that <laughs> it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It wasn't until I came out of Mormonism looking back that I realized. So the the Spirit, the this quote unquote Spirit, spirit of Mormonism keeps you kind of secure and safe and happy and and all is good until until he until he thinks you're looking into stuff and, and may leave and then boy literally all, all hell breaks loose on you so yeah just thought I'd mm -hmm. share that little experience so yes thank you Don that's quite an experience and a, and a testimony and how you went through that and thank God that you were safe and that you weren't harmed. Um, the God was with you during that time. And, you know, where you were trying to sort things out between yeah. Christianity and uh, Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, everything that you've shared about, um, the Father and Jesus and, and the Holy Ghost has been um, really uh, mind-blowing, Don. It really has been, uh, you know, just, just in terms of, um, of, of just looking at the whole, at the whole picture and now understanding um, the differences. Um, I know that there's many who will watch this and have questions, um, a lot, a lot of questions that um, we're, we're, we might not be able to cover tonight because we have a very limited time. But um, something else that that I had wanted us to talk about was um, if if Mormons believe in the Trinity. Um. No, they do not believe in the Trinity. So um, they do not believe in a triune God, three in one. They believe that there are three separate entities and that they are one in purpose. And so um, they have a scripture in, again, in the Pearl of Great Price in Moses 139. And um, where um, God says, behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. 
So they believe that um, God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost are one in purpose, which is to bring to pass the um, immortality and eternal life of man. But they are not a triune God or a trinity. They don't believe that. That's why they just strictly call it the Godhead. Not not the Trinity. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. They yeah, do believe so that the 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 Son, so um, G Jesus and the Holy Ghost are lesser gods than God the Father. So it's kind of like a so like you'll find in Mormonism, um, like at the at the top echelon. So so when it comes to God. There's a president, which is God the Father, and then there's two counselors, which is Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. And then, for instance, um, it's called the first presidency of the Mormon church, which is the prophet or president of the church. And then he's got two counselors. And then down from there, it's the 12 apostles. But there's a president of the 12 apostles, and he's got two counselors. And then, you know, on down from there, each each quorum and everything always has a president and two counselors. And, um, and these are kind of mimicking the, the Godhead. And, you know, and that goes all the way down to like the primary president that's an award that's in, that's responsible for the, the kids. And she's got two counselors and, you know, each priesthood um, group has a president and two counselors and the young women's like I was like, the president of what was called the Laurels. I don't know what they call them nowadays, which was like the um, for young women's for this 16, 17 year old or 17, 18 year old young women, um, you know, and I was the president and I had two counselors, you know, it's just kind of like mimicked in any any grouping within the church. There's always a president and two counselors. And, uh, and it's kind of like the Godhead of Mormonism, which is God the Father who's the president and then Jesus and the Holy Spirit, which are his two counselors, so. Mm -hmm. It's probably a good way to control what's being said and what's not being said. Um, and also um, looking a lot like the true God, because there's always, you know, when there's deception, it's always like a slight truth, you know, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, but it swerves in, in its own direction. And and so, yeah, that was a question I had too about, you know, would would the president be considered, you know, or the prophet be considered a god here on earth? And so, yeah, you answered that question, and it sounds like yes, that that is. Yeah, they they kind of they kind of are, especially you know the prophet and the and the and his counselors. Um, they're called the first presidency, um, but also in you know one thing that makes it very difficult is like in Mormonism the church is basically God and of course the first presidency is controlling the church you know they control everything that's going to be said they have to approve every uh, manual that goes out and as you know you know um, they're teaching the same the same lesson across every every um, every ward worldwide is is being taught the same lesson every week um so and 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 there's there is a lot of control there but also like um at one point in the temple you actually covenant or or make an oath that you will give all your time talents energies everything with which the lord has blessed you everything with which the lord will bless you um to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So you covenant and consecrate all of that stuff, not to God, not to Jesus, but to the church. And, mm -hmm. and the church is kind of like God for most Mormons. And that's why it's so difficult and it's so heartbreaking because um, when, when Mormons do find out that the church has been lying to them, and that it is a deception and a fraud. You know, the church right now is hemorrhaging members. They are hemorrhaging them out. But the heartbreaking part is that 
they don't seek God. They don't want anything to do with God or anything that has to do with God. You know, they go into new age or um, atheism or humanism or, or something, but um, they're not, they're not, they're not seeking our God and our, mm -hmm. and our Jesus. So um, yeah. some of my children included. So yeah, it's very, it's very difficult. Well, that's very helpful because that that's helpful for us in terms of how we pray for our Mormon friends and family, because it is, you know, like they say, they like to say it's very spiritual, you know, and so they are seeking these other things and would be swayed um, to the deceptions of, of, of the world and what's to come. And one, you know, our next, our next um, subject is one that um, has to do with um, angels, because, um, you know, I, I can see, you know, if they're not, um, if they're, they start to find out that Mormonism is, um, is a lie, you know, they'll, they'll go off to these offshoots of spirituality and, 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 you know, the angels and so forth. And so, um, it, I, I, I've always had questions about Moroni. And so, um, you know, you you've talked to us about the the Mormon Godhead and 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 how that works. How what do Mormons believe about angels? Um. So. So Mormons, um, they don't believe that angels are a separate creation, or a separate a separate. Um, type of being than us. They believe just like, um, you know, just like, uh, basically they believe that they're resurrected, either resurrected or um, they're resurrected men, basically. Um, so they do not have wings. They're either resurrected or translated beings. Um, so, um, and, and then they 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 don't believe like you have to wait for the resurrection, like when Jesus comes back. There's some interesting things I could tell you about the resurrection. Uh, we'll have to talk about that sometime other than that. But um, but they believe that, you know, if somebody died and God has a purpose for them, then he can resurrect them at, at any time. He, it doesn't have to wait for a specific time. And also, um, if there's a living being that God needs somewhere, you know, then um, then he can translate somebody at any time, you know, so then they they won't have to taste of death. So, um, so Angel Moroni, um, who, uh, who supposedly appeared to Joseph Smith and then eventually gave him the golden plates, which then became the Book of Mormon, um, they believed that while he was on earth, he was the an ancient rec record keeper, and he was actually the last um, man that actually wrote on the gold plates. Um, and so, and then he was the one that actually took the gold plates and buried them uh, in upstate New York in the Hill Camorra. And then that's where he showed Joseph Smith where to find them. And, um, and so then, Joseph Smith translated those and they became um, the Book of Mormon. So, um, so yeah, we, we kind of brought up the Book of Mormon. There's a lot to go into there, so I won't go into the Book of Mormon, but, um, but uh, they also believe that, so I don't know if you ever noticed on, on one of the drawings here, they have um, the Angel Moroni, which is on the top of all the Mormon temples. So even in Albuquerque, you know, they have that on top of the Mormon temple there. So it's a, so that represents the angel Moroni. And the reason he has a, a trumpet in his hand is because they believe that angel Moroni was, um, is the person, the angel that uh, is talked about in Revelations. So in Revelations 4, 6, um, it says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. 
into every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So that's why they put him on the top of all the temples. And that's why he doesn't have wings because he's just a resurrected man. And, um, and that because he was the last one that wrote in the Book of Mormon and then gave the Book of Mormon to Joseph Smith, that then he's the angel that's basically tanking the gospel to the world in the form of the Book of Mormon. So, um, so yeah, so um, in addition to angels being, um, you know, resurrected or translated beings, they can also be um, spiritual beings. For instance, when it comes to our own guardian angels, they believe that they can be our ancestors. So they can protect us and guide us um, from beyond the grave and, um, and help us out. So then they're kind of our individual angels, our guardian angels. But also they believe that um, the, um, the, the pre-incarnate children, I guess the, the, the ones that haven't been born yet that are going to be our grandchildren or great-grandchildren that haven't been born yet, can also be our guardian angels and guide us and, and you know, and speak to us. And, um, you know, Mormons are very superstitious in that they're very big on, I saw a dream and, you know, so-and-so came back and, you know, and was telling me this or that. They don't believe, they, they totally believe in necromancy because they're very big on seeing people in the temple. They're always having people appear to them in the temples, supposedly. And, um, and I remember my mother having, you know, dreams where my sister who had passed on would come and tell her things. And, um, and then also, um, you know, that your unborn children or grandchildren can come and, and tell you things, you know, as well. And they're both are considered angels as well. So angels mm -hmm. are just us, basically, in one form or the other. Um, and that was what I was thinking, Don, when I was um, mentioning about, you know, like if they if they came, if you know, they started to open their eyes about Mormonism, that it's da it's dangerous because they speak to, um, you know, they they could be speaking to a familiar spirit and think that it's you know family member and it could be an evil spirit speaking to them and then they could become very spiritual you know and in that sense and so wow it's it's definitely a lot for us to to pray about um you know i i did not know that um they believed that um it could be an ancestor or um a progenitor like you said it's just somebody you know somebody who isn't even born yet you know like you've mentioned to me before it's mm -hmm. it's um, it's flabbergasting it's very interesting and i don't know how many times i can tell you about my you know like like um so many times people will say oh you know great aunt so-and-so came to me and said, why haven't you done my temple work yet? You know, and I thought her temple work was done, but I went and checked and no, it wasn't done. And so, you know, so I got busy and we got our temple work done and that will go into a temple discussion at some point, but yeah, you know, they're, they very much believe in, in that the veil is thin, you know? So, so that's, that's very interesting. And yeah, it's, it can be scary, you know, because like, you know, I've had, um, I had a person in my family tell me that my sister who had passed on came to him and told him that I had to come back to Mormonism and stuff like that. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, and, and I, and I, and I believe they believe it and who knows, maybe, maybe something or someone did appear to them. I, I don't know. So, mm -hmm. <sighs> but getting back to angels there's a very interesting aspect of mormonism and this is something that anybody who's been to a mormon temple knows about and believes so um this is very very well known in, in mormonism is that michael the archangel um when um when when he when when adam's body was made out of the 
the earth, then his spirit went into Adam. And um, so then Adam is Michael, the archangel. And so, um, and that's a very, and that's one of the first things they teach you about when you go into the Mormon temple is how Adam is Michael, the archangel. So, um, and they also have something that's called a, um, the Adam God theory, which was a doctrine taught by Brigham Young. Well, I guess it was first taught by Joseph Smith to his inner circle, but then after Joseph Smith died, um, Brigham Young came out and said, "Yes, this is this was a doctrine that Joseph Smith taught to us, his you know his inner circle, and it was the doctrine that um, that Adam." is also our God and the only God with which we have anything to do. So that really complicates the whole thing because then, well, Adam's Michael, is that make Michael our God or, you know, how does that work? So, yeah, I don't know how much time we have to go into that, but that's, that's a pretty crazy doctrine right there. So, and Orson Pride, mm -hmm. Orson Hyde, that was next in line to take Joseph Smith's place was actually because of that doctrine passed over because he could not accept the Adam God doctrine that, um, and so it was, um, and because Joseph Smith had taught it and everything and he couldn't accept it, then he was not considered as one of the ones. There was several people vying to become the, the replacement for Joseph Smith, but that was the main reason why he was not considered. So, so had an important, important place there in their history. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's really complicated. Now, uh, it was already complicated. Now it just really got complicated with, with I've ne I'd never had heard that, Dawn, and I I'm sure that a lot of our audience um, have never heard that either. Maybe some who have gone to the Mormon um, temple, which, um, it sounds like that's something that is taught early on in the church, but that that well, not the Adam God, not the Adam God theory that that they really backed away from. But the fact that Michael, the archangel, is Adam, is mm -hmm. is is there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if there's anybody in our audience that would like to go ask more questions about that, um, put that in the chat in all caps and. I know that Don would be more than happy to answer those questions for us because it is it is very complicated. Um, there there's there's a lot um, in this, Don, and it's it's unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I know that we have about we have about twenty minutes left. Uh, we're running up to two hours. And um, I still have, you know, questions about uh, the roles of women in Mormonism. Um, I had some questions about the Lamanites, um, and and um, I always say this wrong, and you'll correct me, but I can never get this right. Is the quasi codal um, because. Quetzalcoatl. <laughs> I will still forget. Quetzalcoatl. Um, it's a very well-known name in Mormonism. I was raised with the name Quetzalcoatl, so I know how to say that one. <laughs> yeah, when um, my daughter went to um, Cancun this year uh, and she came back and showed us some pictures, you were very familiar with um, a lot of what um, eternity was talking about and I was very surprised and I I have so many questions for you in that area but I know that our our time is um, is limited here because we're going up on two hours almost and you've shared so much we information to talk about the mother in heaven too I was gonna we we're gonna talk about mother in heaven which is very interesting that's kind of in line with yes. the whole Godhead part so but yeah, yeah. she um, gone to Chichen Itza and came back with the from the with the pyramid there. Yeah, the mm -hmm. plumed serpent. Yeah. Yes, so, and so I, 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 
And I know you you were you were questioning about the Liahona. You were wondering what the Liahona was because mm -hmm. you were you had been shown a Liahona magazine and you were just like, what is a Liahona? So yeah. Mm -hmm. And these are things that, you know, um, so when you're raised uh, uh, as an evangelical, you know, you're just taught, you know, very much like Mormons, you're, you're taught, you know, certain things that are, are lies and you just believe that what you know is the truth and um, yeah. that you know, you're, you're, you, you're excluded from the population. So I get that concept because I, I came out of being an evangel, uh, an evangelical and realizing that I had been told many lies and so forth. And so when you, you know, meet a Mormon and you, you, you see, um, you know, some of the things that I, I was very fascinated by was, wow, you know, they can go anywhere in the world on a vacation, go to church and have the same message preached all across mm -hmm. the nation yeah. and in, in other and countries or whatever. Way. They're all talking and, the same about things. Everything's the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was just so fascinating to me because I know like in the evangelical church, everybody, you know, just there's just all these different sects of what's being taught in the churches. So that always fascinated me. Um, the other things that that always, you know, um, got me questioning was, you know, I always thought, wow, you know, are are Mormons racist? You know, because like I'm dark oh, skinned, yeah. and you know, oh, that, and so, you know, I, I wanted to know. Very interesting to go into. We should we should talk about that someday. If anybody wants to or is interested in that, that would be an interesting topic. Yeah. Yeah, put put uh, questions in all caps if you're interested in knowing if you're dark skinned like me and you want to know <laughs> how you're thought about in the Mormon religion. <laughs> put yeah. that in all caps. <laughs> and so yeah, yeah. So um, we we definitely um, have enjoyed this presentation, John. You know, it, it's just been so much information to to process and to um you know just dissect and to to be able to understand and i mean a question i have i have for you is with all this information that that you presented to us you know what would be a a helpful um some helpful tools for us that would want to minister to a Mormon or, you know, we have Mormon missionaries that might come to our door. How, what would be the best way for us to actually begin to um, share truth with them about the true God of the Bible, the true living God of the Bible? <sighs> That's such a tough question because, you know, um, so there's a, there's a term for like, um, people who have left the Mormon church and they, they're talking about people who were totally committed still to the Mormon church and they call them TBMs or true believing Mormons. And that's, that's what I was, you know, I was a true believer, you know, I really, believed all this stuff, you know, and taught my kids about this as well. And so, um, and so it's, it's very difficult to minister to somebody who is in that mindset because they've been taught like, um, you know, don't look at YouTubes that are talking about Mormonism, you know, that's anti-Mormon stuff or don't read any literature that anybody hands to you that's anti-Mormon literature. And, and it's not anti-Mormon. It's just that they're trying to educate Mormons, you know, about, about the true God, you know. And, um, but it's, it's it, you know, if, if anything comes across, because in Mormonism, your identity is so interwoven with the church, you know, and with being a Mormon and you're right. It's just like, um, anytime anybody is talking about 
your beliefs or Mormonism and the, and 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 it seems any the, even the slightest bit um, attacking or the slightest bit you know negative you know they take it very personally it it's like you're you're you know you're um you're rejecting them not their you know what i mean it's like and so their defenses instantly come up and the harder you try to convince them or show them or you know or testify to them the more they're going to just dig, dig their heels in and become you know that much more committed to to their current beliefs so it's it it's a very difficult thing but and in some ways, you know, like some of some of some of these that have left the Mormon Church, um, but have gone to atheism or, you know, or New Age or whatever. I'm like, I don't know. Sometimes I even wonder, like, you know, would they have been better off, <laughs> you know, in Mormonism than than where they're at now, you know, because they they seem to have gone even farther away from God, you know, so. So I think a lot of it is just really um, coming across in a way that is not pointed at them at all, not pointed at their religion, just maybe sharing, like ask them what they believe about something. And then, um, and then once they tell you, just don't be like, don't roll your eyes or anything, just kind of go, oh, wow, that's really interesting, you know? Um, you know, because I, I believe this, you know, and just, or maybe, and just let it be known that, um, that if they ever do have any questions about, you know, about what you believe, you know, that they, that, that just leave the door open that they can come and ask you about it. Because I know at the one point when I was really questioning Mormonism, and I was really wanted to talk to um, I had so many questions, you know, and just really wanted to talk to a belief, you know, a true believer, you know, not true believing Mormon, but somebody who truly believed in, in Christ. And, um, but anytime I would like present a question or, you know, try to interject myself in a conversation when people were talking about God, you know, since they all knew I was Mormon, they thought that I was going to try to convert them, you know. And so they would just ignore me or walk away or whatever. And, and I really sincerely wanted answers to my questions, you know? So just making sure that you you leave that door open. And if they do ever come to you with questions, you know, be there for them. Um, I think a lot of it is just discerning the spirits because, um, because God does have a remnant everywhere. I believe he has remnant in the Catholic Church. I believe he has remnant in the Mormon Church. I believe he has remnant in Islam and Hinduism. I mean, he's got his remnant everywhere, and his arm is not short. His arm can reach anybody. All flesh is in his hands, and it can reach anybody. I, God pulled me out uh, alone. Like nobody, nobody came and talked to me about anything or said anything he, you know, he just, he, he did it. It was just him, you know? And so, um, so I think what you can do is just really, really pray for them. Just sincerely pray for them that they, that, that God leads them to him, to the true God, to the true Jesus, um, through the true Holy Spirit, you know, and that, um, and then if there's somebody, you know, who's really close to you, who you're really concerned about their salvation, just fast, have a fast specifically for that person and just fast for them and pray for them and just really, um, you know, try to have God inspire you as to reach that individual person. Because I think it's very individual for each person, you know, and um and that he he can reach them, but definitely never come on, because um, you know you can tell when somebody's trying to convert you, you know, and Mormons can pick up on that instantly. So if they feel like you're trying to convert them, they're going to get very defensive, and the walls will go up. So 
just um, trying to be very open, non-judgmental, non-attacking, you know, but share, share what you believe, you know, and, um, and if the spirit, if the Holy Spirit is there, then he will testify to their heart, you know, that there is something there. Just try to plant the seeds and um, read the, read the Bible to them because they're very, they very much pick and choose the Bible scriptures that um, they can twist to, um, to the doctrine that they believe, you know, and they don't, they don't read the Bible a lot. So um, maybe read to them out of the Bible, you know, say, oh, I believe this because of this, you know, because it says this here, you know, and um, just try to, try to just really listen to the spirit, you know, I think it's going to be unique for each and, in, in, you know, a very individual thing. But he will, if you have a heart, a pure heart that truly wants to reach these people, then he will show you the way. Mm -hmm. well, that's very helpful, Don. I, I appreciate that because um, I know that many of us have, you know, loved ones that, that are not saved and, or possibly in, in some other um, cult. Um, and so I, I do agree with you, you know, praying, um, as brother David has said, you know, going to the prayer closet, that's definitely something that, um, God does yeah. answer prayers. And, um, I, I believe that wholeheartedly, you know, really, really praying targeted prayers for our, our unsaved loved ones, um, is definitely a good recommendation. And um, I do appreciate your time, Dawn, and um, your suggestions and this presentation. Uh, I know we didn't get to finish it. We still had, I, I think we're, we were just about halfway. Um, <laughs> I would love to be able to do part two to, to finish. <laughs> Yeah, no, but it was, it was very, very intriguing, very interesting, and gave very good perspective to understand what is being taught out there, because um, I do know that Mormons claim to be Christian, and so, you know, I've always just wondered, you know, I wonder why they named it, you know, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It might have been better to have said, Church of Joseph Smith of Latter Day Saints. You know, it's just the the Jesus Christ aspect in it that really makes it appear Christian, but it really is a different. It is different than the than the uh, what the Word of God teaches about. And so, you know, yeah. it's interesting that you that you say you know read the Word with with them because um, I do know from my own experience. That I have read with my my Mormon family, um, the King James Bible, and you know, there's been some some things. I, I remember reading something out of Timothy, and and uh, Timoth, you know, um, it talking about the genealogies. But you know, I think it's I think it's the veil that you that you mentioned. Like they're gonna they're going to kind of dissect what they want to hear and what they don't want to hear. And in fact, at our, at our remnant, at our ta uh, Feast of Tabernacles, where, where you joined us last year, we had um, two of our Mormon family members that came out and they read scripture with us. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like they're, they, they shut it down. It's just, we really need to be praying and be yeah. the example. If they want to talk about what, how they interpret that scripture, let them talk about it. And then you give your interpretation of it, but let it be very, not like, not trying to push anything on them, you know, because then they mm -hmm. will shut down. And mm -hmm. I've just got to say, I am just so tickled that I got to be your first guest. So thank you so much for having me. This has been really fun. Thank you. We're going to have you back for part two. There's lots of things we didn't cover. And, um, you know, th I'm sure there'll be questions in the chat that we'll address as well. And so we'll get, we'll, we'll work on getting part two scheduled here soon. And thank you so much for your time. And 
I just love you so much and oh, thank God for 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 pulling the treasures out of darkness um because that's really what what we are and um I'm yeah. just so grateful. He's so merciful. He is so good. I just I just praise his holy name every day that he pulled me out of Mormonism. Even though the journey has been difficult, it has been so wonderful and so amazing to come to know the true God. Yes. Well, Don, with that being said, um, if, you, if, you, if you have any last thoughts, um, share them with, with our audience and um, we're going to get ready to close this out. I think I'm good. I think I said enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah. So all thank right. you all for joining us and thank you for um, being here with us. If there's anyone who's heard this message and wants uh, more information, please reach out to us um, at the FOJC Radio Underground Church. There's a, a website there on the bottom, or you can email me directly if you um have questions or you would uh, like to have an interview or you have somebody that you'd like to suggest in an interview as an interviewee, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you so much for spending some time with us. God bless you all. Good night. Good night. Mm -hmm.